screaming silence. It was a cold and chilly night. A man woke up in the middle of the night around 3.30 a.m. and lit a lamp to write something on his writing pad. It was Matthew, who lives in Schrodi, a small town near Amsterdam in the Netherlands. It was the 16th century and Amsterdam was under the rule of King Benedict. Matthew was a scholar, writer and philosopher. He was an active participant against the ill policies of Benedict's rule. He clashed with the current course of politics and society. There were many other writers also in the city, but they used to write their article praising King's policies and rule. Due to their needlessness, they used to receive rewards and titles from the King's court. On the other hand, Matthew stood alone against the king's ill rule. He used to write articles of revolt against the king's rule in the weekly journal called the Amsterdam Journal. And due to this, he was arrested at least three to four times. But he continued his writing. Matthew had mass support. The people of Amsterdam knew he was right. He was fighting for the welfare and right of the common people. They were with him. Benedict, on the other hand, was reckless and believed in living an extravagant and lavish life. He was least concerned about the welfare of the people of his state. Matthew became a well-known figure and the people had full faith and support for him. And they looked up to him for a change, a revolutionary change. He was a hero of the masses. Everybody liked him, except one person. That was his wife, Ozita. Ozita used to scold and curse Matthew for whatever he was doing. Though she was not concerned about the articles which he used to write, but she was only concerned about the condition of her family. Day by day, they were moving towards poverty. She used to blame him for their pathetic condition. She was unhappy with her life and blamed Matthew for this. But on the other hand, he used to explain to her that what he was doing was correct and for the welfare of everyone. But Rosita never paid any attention to this. She was frustrated with his idea of helping others. According to her, he ruined her life and was fit for nothing. In spite of the fact that Rosita hated Matthew, he always loved her. He knew he was right and one day or the other, Rosita will definitely understand his ideology. Matthew made several attempts to convince her but always failed to do so. One day, Matthew published an article in the Amsterdam Journal exposing the king's sex scandal. News reached Benedict. He immediately asked his kinsman to put Matthew behind bars. The order was obeyed and soon Matthew was in jail. After a week he was sentenced to death and as the news was known, there was an all-out revolt against the king by Matthew's supporters. For a week or two, the revolt continued, but the king didn't change his decision. Uzita was shocked to see such a following for her husband. She now began to realise the greatness of Matthew, who always fought for the welfare of others. She was sad and started crying. This realisation came very late to her, when everything was lost. Finally, the day has arrived, when Matthew was to be hanged till death. Ozita, with the permission of the king, went to see her husband for the very last time. She was beside herself, she was crying, crying her eyes out. And whilst they were sitting in a small room, Matthew had a long beard by now, he was just looking at the other side of the wall. Ozita was crying, and she was so sorry that she'd done wrong on him, and said to him, 
Please forgive me, I'm sorry. I was a fool who failed to understand a great man like you. Matthew never said a single word. He was calmer looking towards the wall. She pleaded with him to speak to her. He didn't utter a single word. He was silent. And with only ten seconds left, Matthew stood up and kissed her on her forehead and said, I always loved you and I always will. These were the last words that she heard from him. Matthew was taken away from her and she was left there crying. He was hanged to death. A great soul left the world, leaving behind him a cruel king, his followers and a wife who lived the rest of her life in regret for not loving and understanding her great husband, Matthew. The End Hello, my name is Michael Don Smith. And my name is Michael De Groot. And together, we are bringing you the story of a speech podcast. Great. That was uh, the first of uh, Michael's stories. Really enjoyed that, Michael. And we'll be having one of those, usually at the beginning, may change the future, but I love it. The idea is that we we use these powerful stories in life, in business. Now, the last few podcasts we had were about the story of the speech. And the next five, we're going to look at speeches in movies. Now, there is there are speeches, speaking movies that are called monologues. And there are some really great ones over time in movies and in plays, of course. So today, I'm going to look at, we're going to look at one of my favorites, which is, of course, Colonel Jessup's speech in A Few Good Men, which starred, of course, uh, who was Colonel Jessup? Jack Nicholson, a young Tom Cruise, and it was one of the breakout movies for Debbie, Debbie Moore, I want to say. Is that the right name, Michael? I don't know. I don't (laughs) know. Demi Moore, Demi Moore. Demi Moore, <laughs> Demi Moore yeah, and Demi Kevin Moore. Bacon's in there as and well. And Kevin Bacon, yes, without yeah. his other Rat Pack colleagues. Kevin Bacon was with uh, another pack. So, yes, it was a really um, important movie, and this speech is an important speech. So let's play you 1 minute 34 of pure cinema genius. Santiago was a substandard Marine. He was being transferred. That's not what you said. You said he was being transferred because he was in grave danger. That's correct. You said he was in danger. I said grave danger. You said, is there any... I recall what I I said. I can have the court reporter read back to you. I know what I said. I don't have to have it read back to me like I'm... Why the two orders? Colonel? Sometimes men take matters into their own hands. No, sir, you made it clear just a moment ago that your men never take matters in their own hands. Your men follow orders or people die. So Santiago shouldn't have been in any danger at all, should he have, Colonel? You snotty little bastard. Your Honor, I'd like to ask for a recess. I'd like an answer to the question, Judge. The court will wait for an answer. If Lieutenant Kendrick gave an order that Santiago wasn't to be touched, then why did he have to be transferred? Colonel? Lieutenant Kendrick ordered the code red, didn't he? Because that's what you told Lieutenant Kendrick to do. Object! And when it went bad, you cut cuts. these guys loose! Your Honor, you had Marcus inside a phony transfer. Your Honor, you doctored the logbook. Damn it, Captain! You coerced the doctor. Consider Not yourself in contempt. contempt. Colonel Jessup, did you order the code red? You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled to You them. want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Son, we live in a world that has walls, and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. Who's going to do it? You? You, Lieutenant Weinberg? I have a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. You weep for Santiago, and you curse the Marines. You have that luxury. You have the luxury of not knowing what I know, that Santiago's death, while tragic, probably saved lives, and my existence, while grotesque and incomprehensible to you, saves lives. 
You don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. We use words like honor, code, loyalty. We use these words as the backbone of a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. I have neither the time nor the inclination to explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the blanket of the very freedom that I provide and then questions the manner in which I provide it. I would rather you just said thank you and went on your way. Otherwise, I suggest you pick up a weapon and stand a post. Either way, I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. Did you order the code red? I did the job. Did you order the code red? You're damn right I did! Wow, that was that was amazing hearing that again. I I really do enjoy it and thank you for suggesting that particular clip. He he's an amazing actor, I think. <laughs> yeah. So what did you think of it then? What, what if you had to sum up what that speech was about? Well, there's there's a huge amount going on. And for me, what was so amazing was his use of language um, and it, it, his choice of words was so appropriate for trying to get his message across and getting the audience on his side, right? So just for a moment, although he's done this terrible deed, whatever it is, um, and, San, and Santiago obviously died as a result of it, and he's obviously going to be charged for it. The thing is, he manages just for a moment to get the audience on his side because of the language that he's using. Does that make sense? Okay, well, yeah, it does. I'm, I'm not sure all of the audience would be on his side because, of course, it's very military, but that was 100% his intention. Mm. And look at the structure of the to support and to support your argument that the intention of his speech was to get the audience the courtroom the judge everybody to understand how important the task was that he carries out and why he should be left alone to do it and therefore it doesn't matter what um lieutenant weinberg thinks because it's, it's immaterial because what he's doing is so important and in the structure a b c the, the A is where you grab the attention of the audience and you create your authority. Then B, there's the body where you add the substance to support your intention. And then you close it with a call to action. So if we look at those three bits in his speech, he actually starts off, son, we live in a world that has walls and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. That first bit there, even the first word, son, He's establishing authority. He's grabbing attention. And then he makes it even powerful. So we live in a world that has walls. And then mm. after he's made clear his authority, then he then asks the question, it's got to be God. Who's going to do it? You? You? Are you going to do it? So that's his introduction. That's the opening of the speech. Very powerful. Grabs your attention. It tells, almost says what he wants to happen. And, he's, and then he, the rest of it, the next part, is where he establishes the reasoning, the ground for that. I have a greater responsibility than you have. You don't want the truth. You've got to handle the truth. We use words like honor, code, royalty. And in fact, that's the body. The close is where he says, I have neither the time nor the inclination to explain myself to you because I, what I've done saves your life, keeps you safe. So what I'm going to do is ask you to say thank you and I can get up and go out because you know, that my argument is so sound. Those call to action is basically, either way, I don't give a damn what you think they're entitled to, I'm head leaving out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, it is It is perfect, like, how you teach it, the ABC <laughs> method, in even, you know, the monologue in a, in, in a movie, somebody trying to get their point across and get the audience on their side. And... With for me, the audience, although you're talking about the courtroom, for me, it's the audience watching the movie, right? So that's okay. me watching the movie, looking at it, you know, knowing that he's a bad, 
um, a bad officer, but because of what he says and because he uses this color colorful language, you almost can't disagree with him. He's convinced I mean, me. Yeah, I think you need, yeah, that was good. You need to use the word I and me because I was, I mean, I, I don't know when you last saw the film, but obviously the bit, there's, a, there's a really important bit in that courtroom scene, which, which you can't see here, where the uh, interrogator, Lieutenant Weinberg, plays a trick on him. He says they found the flight log of the plane that took Santiago off the island. Which is a, which is a, a ruse. He, there was no, there's no such flight log, but it creates doubt in his mind. What we're saying is that because he arranged for this marine to be killed, murder actually, that I, I have that in the back of my mind. I'm hearing his his speech. That, you know, mm -hmm. you use words like honor, loyalty. I'm thinking, well, you're not being very honorable. <laughs> you're not very loyal to loyal mm -hmm. because. This marine was under, under your care. Yes, he doesn't say it in this speech. So that was one of the things that I know. And he's he's more more interested in his own power, and that's the point of his speech. He's saying, "I'm so powerful. I'm so you know. I'm you know. I'm the man that keeps the country safe. I should be able to do anything I want." So his argument is, the end justifies the means. Yes. And that's uh, that's the point I'm making, though. And you're right; yeah. you've got a bit of memory of the movie. I don't, <laughs> and it has been a long yeah. time. So I've watching this clip is almost for me or hearing it because our podcast listeners are obviously hearing it, and that's even more powerful when you're just hearing the voice. But for me, even though he's in court and he's accused of murder or a crime that he's responsible for, and only he is responsible because he ordered the whatever, Code Red. Code Red, uh, yeah. The, even though he's ordered it, the words that he's using sub with his explanation, you've almost got to go, well, actually, maybe he is right. He was right yeah. to do it because he's right, you know, He's got greater responsibility more than we can fathom. Um, we have the luxury of not knowing what he knows. Um, he yeah. he's right that we're you know we sleep under a. This is I mean this one is just in, incredible. He says, "I don't have to explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the blanket of the very freedom that I provide." and then questions the manner in which I provide it. And he's 100% right. You know, we do, because of our military, because of our Navy, we do sleep under a blanket of freedom. But using that colourful language as well, and just putting in the storytelling element, because he's using that kind of language, I get these visual images and... You know, so you can see the blanket of freedom um, around you, almost. You can see it physically. So the, the use of language is is just superb. It's whoever brilliant. has written it, yeah, it's brilliant. Uh, but are, are we living in an era where Donald Trump is using the same style of rhetoric and pictures? In fact, his pictures aren't so much eloquent but they are stark you know we're going to build a wall bam there's no logic there's no mm. accountability so we're going to build a wall and people as you say they see the wall yes and they see this man who's going to build a wall so the blanket so colonel just blanket is donald trump's wall yeah they are they they you're right and they're probably because we know the word metaphors right but what's being used in here and what Donald Trump uses as well is something called metonymy. And so it's a type of metaphor, but the person who's hearing the description, the colourful language, you've actually got to work at it a little bit to really get the meaning of it. 
And by you having to work at it, it lands harder in your brain. You actually will remember it for longer and you will because you've actually had to use your brain power to make a better understanding of it. So when he says blanket of the very freedom, that doesn't there is not such a thing. There is not a blanket made of freedom. It doesn't exist, right? But because he's using it, we all understand what he means by it. Yeah, he keeps saying we all, but yeah, the majority of people are together. So just checking in with you. So a metaphor is where real objects that really exist are used to express or to represent the point. Yeah, he, he runs like a rabbit, for example. Yes, yeah, so, so a rabbit really exists. Yes. But to my economy, you're saying that's where it's an imaginary thing. So you've actually got to, so everybody, in fact, visualizes their own blanket. Yeah. Because my blanket is a patchwork quilt one. It's not a posh one like yours. Yours will be like a <laughs> really posh Marks and Spencer blanket. Yeah. <laughs> Mine's electric as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what, yeah. So I, I really get that. So by making that to work at it creative, we've got to use our own neurology. So because we've built that piece and we've built that picture, it's hard to let go of something that you've created yourself. Mm. So that's, with, that's, a, that's an excellent speech writing or storytelling tool there. And it's filled. To go go, go on. on. No, it's filled with those in the whole speech, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, we live in a world that has walls. So, but where are the walls? They, <laughs> they're, they're not there. You know? yeah. <laughs> they're not but physical you, walls. And then he, 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 he emphasizes or increases by saying, not only is there a wall, but you want me on that wall. You yes. need me on that wall. So if you hadn't got the wall the first time, it's making it so important. So, you know, we live in a world with walls. And, and that, because that wall's there, we protect you with things you can't talk about at parties. Yes. So you know what? Not only is there a wall, but you want me on that wall. Yes. You need me on that wall. Yes. It's very, very powerful, very persuasive language. So what? Couple of things though is why doesn't it land then? Why doesn't it, why doesn't why doesn't the judge in the courtroom go? Wow, yeah, you're right. Well, because obviously Tom Cruise manages to, you know, get him angry through his yeah. questioning, so he comes out with this rhetoric, this particular monologue that we've just heard. And then at the end of it, he lands the punchline because he's in that rage and anger. He can ask him the question to get him to say yes to, which is, did you order the code red? I, and I agree. And the, the other, the, uh, the additional technique is he's not hypnotized by the rhetoric. Yes. You see, the speech is that I think the speech, okay, yes, it is a movie and the speech is to the audience and to the courtroom. But it's a battle between two men. It's the young upstart and the old general. Mm. And the young upstart plays to that, he plays to his weakness. He knows that by being arrogant, being aggressive, being cheeky, he's not, he's not, this guy's just given this brilliant speech. We've examined it instead of how brilliant it was, he's got metonymy. Because this guy's a, an orator. He had to lead men into war. He yes. knows how to. So the, the speech, the kind of speech he would have written with the full knowledge of how to write a speech. And he knows how powerful it's going to be. And he's waiting for this young man, son. Remember right at the beginning? Mm. Son. Son. Mm. Yeah, that's how he says it, son. You, you little green, you're, you're wet behind the ears. Don't you realize we live in a world that has walls, you young, you just don't understand. You weep, Santiago, and you curse the Marines. You have that luxury, son. So it's geared at disempowering um, the, 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 the guy who's Kathy or you know, the Tom Cruise character. is meant to scare him and let him wake up to the reality. Yes. And what he's done is consistently, there's a part, again, it's not here, there's a thing where he says, um, in fact, it's how the speech starts, isn't it? Mm. He says, um, Colonel Jessup, did you order the code red? 
And Colonel Jessup says, I don't have to answer that question. And the judge says, you, sorry, and the judge says, you don't, the judge tells Jessup he doesn't have to answer the question. Mm. Did you order the code red? He does, because to answer it would be to incriminate himself. From the yes. Fifth Amendment, you can't, you don't have to incriminate yourself. Right. So Kathy screams at him, cheeky, young app star, and he says, did you order the code red in that insolent way? And he's begging to tell him that he is, you know, he wants to tell him, I'm of course I ordered it. And the judge warns me, don't have to answer the question. Yeah. And Jessup says, I will answer the question. You want answers. And then it might have calmed down. It might have calmed down. But then Kathy, knowing he's, on, he's on, in the right area, he, he's even more cheeky. The, he said, ask him a question. The judge said, don't answer it. Colonel Jessup says, I'm going to answer the question. He said, I'm going to answer it. And then Kathy says, I'm entitled to the answer. He goes, oh, my God, you want answers? Or oh, I'm going to give you answers. And even then, he doesn't let him go. He, goes, he carries on being cheeky. He goes, yeah, I want the answers, and I want the truth. So he goads him three times, and that's when the speech comes out. Yeah. So he set him up perfectly. So that, and then all he does is keep asking the same question and doesn't get hypnotized by the rhetoric. Mm. I mean, it is a great example that the level of confidence that Jessup conveys in his speech uh, monologue, that, that arrogant confidence thus make it very believable. So I, I guess the lesson when you're listening to people who are speaking and, oh my God, I went, I went to, let me just share this quick story. I, I know I've already shared a story, but this is just a, <laughs> this is, this is a real life story. <laughs> I went to um, Venture Fest in, at the NEC last Friday, Thursday, last Thursday. And it was a full day of kind of different events going on, pitch fest and, but there were a couple of keynotes that started off the day. They, um, we, we need to get involved with this event because they yeah, were yeah. so bad. They oh, were no. so bad. You well, would so, have- Sorry, this, this is a podcast. They, they could have done better. Okay, they could, <laughs> <laughs> scratch that, ignore that. Yeah. They, they could have been better. Yeah, they need they need a little bit of tuition. But it wasn't just the method of speaking. It was also the slides they were using <laughs> and oh, the way they were communicating. Wow. And it wasn't just me. People were looking at me and kind of putting their eyes to heaven. Um, yeah. All sorts of things were going on. Or I mean, multiple. But... What, what what the point I'm trying to make? It, it just made me think of that episode last week. The point I'm trying to make is that this kind of impact, this being, if you wanted really people to hear your message, um, to have this level of confidence that he has in this monologue, you know, there's something to be said for that. Yeah, and, and although we know that it was written. In, if, we go, if we enter the world of the movies, I like it because I can suspend my disbelief and believe that the character would have been able to construct a speech like this on the fly because he's given speeches to soldiers. He's had to sit down and write speeches before they go to war. You know, that's his, that's his job. It's a yes. big part of generals to motivate their staff. So he's actually pulled all his years of experience together to very, very quickly outline the why, where, why, what, when, where, of why he's correct. And he's done it, and he's got away with it. He doesn't have to answer the question, and that speech would still have justified him to the courtroom. The courtroom were on his side, as you said. So mm. that, that, and what to, although I wasn't at VentureFest, I find people, because they have so much data, they try and convince their audience with data, he could have said the time of the plane, the, the 
there's lots of dates, but didn't use that because he's a leader, he's yeah. a general. So he uses the language mm. to get to get, you know, we use words like honor, code, loyalty. It is juxtaposed that against you go to parties, we go to war. You yes. know, all that's in there. And at these, at these bond events, we've got PowerPoint slides, we've got Google, we can access everything. And we try and win our arguments with logic and with data, big data, big data. No, the reason that Instagram is a more powerful method of convincing your audience to buy your products than the television or the library, because Instagram is instant. It's a picture, bam, it's emotional. You know, the, why is Donald Trump getting more, um, more of his message across using Twitter? He can't spell, he can't write for dog poo, but because he's constrained <laughs> these characters, he's 244, now it's 288. He, he's, he's as good as an orator as anybody else in 288 characters. Yeah. You know, I, every time he attacks him, he replies. Go on, sorry. Yeah. No, the, he's, he's made Twitter his channel of choice in terms of communicating his opinion, his feelings, his emotion, and showing kind of the raw side this is the first time in modern history that a senior leader of, you know, or the leader of the free world is expressing himself and in a way that people uh, like to think they understand. Unfortunately, most of what he says are lies. They're, they're not all, they're, they're untrue. And there are people that have even been checking up on that and how many, you know, how many lies um, he's been saying since he's been in office. Uh, the, but people the, believe it because it's written down. Well, it's more than that. It's the fact that it's so short. Yes. And, you, and, he, and he, if you look at different arguments, argument ad hominem, he, he uses all the arguments. So argument ad hominem is argument to the person. So someone will say that he's a liar, he's a cheat, he's a philanderer. Big long stem look about, yeah, but she's ugly. Mm. And that's his quote, that's his defense. His defense oh. is, yeah, but she, she's ugly. Yeah. And it plays to the base because people have got a big mass of stuff over there on one side and got, she's ugly. And they look at, well, actually, she is. So nothing in this telling the truth. Or argument ad bellaculum, which is an argument of aggressiveness. And you go, well, I'm Donald Trump. No, we'll, we'll put so we'll shock and awe, we'll destroy the Koreans. Will destroy them. No logic. No, or, or is tariffs? No. Oh, the the economy is this. We've got this many dollars for that, and thousands of pounds. We'll slap tariffs on them and force them to agree to us. The very brevity of what he's saying, he actually delivers arguments incredibly briefly, and they they're on the scale outweighing. Well, how much column inches have been written? How many? Hours of film has been written about Trump. The, the, the just, reporters and journalists say they're overwhelmed by it. They can't keep up with it. The amount of it is so much. They are struggling, literally, to keep up with it all. And he, on the other hand, is making all that happen with 288 characters. Yeah, yeah. Albeit yeah. late night mornings, but he is, in his own way, it's relentless because he's always... He just always responds. And so he's, he's in a battle where he's totally outgunned, totally outmanned, and they still, they're still struggling to, to cope with him. Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We, we need a... Uh, we need a go on. But that's coming back to the movie and what Jessup is doing is exactly that. That's what you're saying, just coming back yeah. to it. His his rhetoric or his monologue is exactly doing by by saying things that you can't actually disagree with, you're almost forgiving him his crime. Yeah. Almost. Because you, yeah, because you know, you don't want he's just making statements, you know, even from the word of son, it's belittling him. 
we use words like honor, code, loyalty. We use words the backbone of a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. So it's denigrating the lawyer instead of the argument. Mm. And then he says, you know, and he, wants to, he says, I want an explanation. I deserve the truth. Because I don't have time to give you the truth because I'm giving you freedom. Yeah. That's what Donald Trump actually said that. He says, his base, if he shot somebody in Times Square, they wouldn't even arrest him. That's how much, you know, that's how much they love him. So truth and justice goes out the window if you're powerful, if, you're, if, you, if the other thing you're doing is so good. So, so, so I'll, I'll read an exa- I'll read a tweet out, shall I? Yeah, yeah, with Donald, Th- yeah. This is a good one. It says, the fake news media, I can't do his accent, but the <laughs> fake news media, in particularly the falling, sorry, the failing New York Times is writing phony and exaggerated accounts of the border detention centres. First of all, people should not be entering our country illegally only for us to then have to care for them. We should be allowed to focus on, and then the second tweet, United States citizens first. And then he goes on and on and on. Border Patrol and other law enforcement have been doing a great job. We said there was a crisis. The fake news and the Democrats said it was manufactured. Now all agree we were right, but they always knew that. And then he goes on and on and on and on. Uh, we pick all that part, couldn't we? Because the crisis is, de- he's made the crisis. Hmm. There's never been so many people at the board as he's started. Yes. So there, you know, it wasn't a crisis before he started. But now, he, and and again, it denigrated the failing New York Times. Yeah. Just, yeah, the guy is so accurate in his argument. But, but argument doesn't, just because you've got an argument doesn't mean that you're telling the truth. No, but because he's saying people should not be entering our country illegally, you can't argue with that. Yeah, it's true. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you can't. Yeah, that's true. People shouldn't be entering illegally. So therefore, well, there's, he- more, there's more entering illegally than when he started telling they shouldn't enter illegally, though. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> okay. So. Um. Back to Jack Nicholson then. Yeah. Um, the, the, the one thing for me that, or obviously the writer, but I'm putting it back to him, is, is just to circle back what I said right at the beginning, his use of the language, the colourful language that he uses, the metonymies that he uses, um, which is a type of metaphor where you're having to do a lot of the work um, to make sense of it is it's just brilliant, a brilliant example. And visually, and you may have a comment on this, but you create images in your brain or in your head by listening to some of the things like the walls, like men with guns, um, you know. Yeah, you- yeah. So, so I think I, I do... A lot of um, speaker trainers and people talk about speech. They talk, they they create a universal truth that words become pictures. Yes, but not some people. Words trigger feelings or trigger. For instance, when when I hear the word wall, it does. I don't see. Um, now I'm thinking about it. I have to literally think to see a wall. I actually extend the metaphor and i think when i see a wall i i i get other words like barrier resistance blockage those, those are kind of words or concepts come to me more than the pictures right so the elicit other frames of uh representation yes um when you say i see these words the backbone until this conversation i never even thought of a backbone it's for his back. You know, the actual backbone? Yes, yes. A backbone to me is a solid structure that's holding up. So I don't do the translation. Mm. So power of words is that they do elicit not just visual representations, but emotional representations. Mm. So a word like, um, as you got one name, must have one name, the very freedom. 
well, like you said, I don't know what color that blank is. Freedom is the blanket. Mm. So when I hear the word freedom, I think of release, lightness. A visual person might see a dove flying away somewhere. Yes. So that's the beauty of this language. It actually gets everybody. He's got language that's definitely visual. So backbone, wall, blanket. But it then connects the visual language with the kinesthetic or the feeling. So the blanket of the very freedom is hitting you in two different places there. It's also got movement, physical movement, which is the man. Look at this. Look how much is in this paragraph. Mm. Have neither the time nor the inclination. Time, concept, inclination, movement. To explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the blankets, you've got physical movement, the blanket, you've then got something you can see, and very freedom, you've got feeling that I provide. That's all wrapped in one paragraph. Yes. Yeah. It's amazing. So, yeah, you're right. So, yeah, so when we say it's colorful language, I'm saying it's colorful, it's lyrical, it's physical, it's emotional in one minute, 34 seconds. And of course, Jack delivers it as only Jack Nicholson can. So how, how, how can we as mere mortals say in, the, in our lives, whether we're in business or not in business, how can we adopt some of this thinking that we're learning from this, this monologue? Yeah. How can we well, apply that in our speeches or our 60 second yeah, elevator very. pitches? It's very important. So there is a, a graphic I showed you. So there's what well, it's all illustrated. But basically, it's to look at what, if you are going to write, and ideally you should write it to start with, not to memorize it, but just to get the feeling. Hmm. You look at the, the, your natural language, so you'll find that you do use words that are a particular way, and then to try and adapt. So you've got um, in NLP or in psychology, they talk about visual, kinesthetic, Auditory, VAK, visual, auditory, kinesthetic. But there's also olfactory, smells, and it's like similar to kinesthetic, but it's, it's proxemic, it's proprioception, it's getting closer by a man who rises and sleeps. So sleeping isn't really a movement. No. <laughs> you fall asleep, you don't go anywhere. So that, that's that, that's a, you know, for, so you can use language. So adding some of this, and you've got red rag to a ball, goes like red rag to a ball, then it could be a, an alarm clock to wake somebody up, so that's sound, or it could be a throw a bucket of cold water in somebody's face. Yes. So these are three different modalities. So somewhere in the speech you might say, it's like a red rag to a ball, that's visual. Somewhere else you might say, like an alarm clock, it woke me up. That's auditory. And then you could say, it was like a splash of cold water in my face. That's kinesthetic. Yes. So that's how you try and mix it up. Don't use all the same modality. when you. And this speech is such a great example of packing everything in, including the kitchen sink. Well, why do you say don't use all the same modality? Because in our audiences we have a mixture of people. So we will always have a mixture of people. So what one, one man's meat is another man's poison. Mm -hmm. So what will be quite, it's like when people say, um, the, the modern thing is they have PowerPoints. They don't put any words on their PowerPoint. Yes. Just big pictures. Because the picture paints a thousand words and makes a rabbit. Well, uh, no. Well, I don't know what the percentages are, but I always work on a rule of 25, 25, 20. I was, I was split on the So some people love pictures, but there'll be some accountants, some analytical people in the audience who want to see the numbers. They want the black and whites. They want that. So you do want to have even just one or two words on your slides. For those mm. people. Um, so in disc profile, you have the D. The D person just wants a picture. They want it instantly, and a picture gives them as much as they can handle in one go. But if you have in this, I think D is the dominant directive, you have the influencer, you have steady, and you have the um, 
person who dots the I's and crosses the T's. So you will have a mixture of all these people in your audience. So by changing modalities, you make sure you appeal to everybody. Mm. Because that is your goal. Your goal is to get as many people as possible to understand your message. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's been a full one, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. And, you know, the, the lesson for me on this is, or what I will walk away from this is the kind of impact that it makes um yeah. and the passion obviously comes across the acting is superb and i i highly recommend for people to watch the the clip as well to see him in action and but i think the impact for me was i nearly believed him you know because yeah. it was so powerful the language that he used but the emotion and how he delivered it I kind of went, yeah, well, I can't argue with any of what he just said. So I'm kind of on his side now, but really he's done a bad thing. So maybe, yeah, he should go down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, I love it all. I'm, uh, the good thing about the uh, Michael and Michael podcast is we get, we get uh, as we just said, different viewpoints. Because I think um, the hero is a Lieutenant Junior Robbery's Cathy. Because he just stuck to his guns, refused to be hypnotized by the language. And it was yes. not an easy thing because he was a junior officer. So, yeah, that's, that's really good. And um, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm thinking maybe I should watch that film again. Yeah, me maybe too. Not. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Really good. So, I think we're about um, wrapped up. And again, as happens with this podcast, when we've done it, I think we'll go ask better go and listen to this again because it sounded quite interesting. Most definitely. Thank you, Michael. Right, thank you, Michael. I've been Michael Don Smith. And I've been Michael De Groot. And we've been sharing with you the story of a speech. 